Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. It's Thanksgiving weekend. This is uh, November the 25th, 2018. And I hope everybody had a great, well, if you're in the United States anyway, you're celebrating Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, if you are, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving and ate lots of turkey and other other things. So, um, I don't know how many live, is, uh, live viewers we'll get tonight because I think everybody's either probably still with family or returning home, but that's okay. People will probably want to listen later on in the week. Uh, if you are a live viewer, you know, you can do the live chat thing and, and, uh, consult Kelly if you want to, whatever, whatever you want to say, you know, I'm just throwing ideas yeah. out there. I'm sure. They did so me. Yeah. Well, yeah, they wouldn't really have a reason to, but they can make something up. In fact, I got to think, I can't remember who it was that, uh, that sent the, uh, the shot of the Zima where I could find some. Oh yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. awfully nice. Yeah. Yeah, in Japan. <laughs> On my way. On your way. Uh, yeah, I got a lot, a lot of nice notes from people, too, this week uh, about the show. So thanks, guys. Um, so Pikmin's Gallery is out, right, Matt? Yes, uh, it's available on Amazon. Um, I got my couple copies, and I have an extra copy we are going to give away as a prize today to some lucky viewer. Right. Uh, one of the guest panelists today, Pete Rollick, has a, a story in here which is really quite entertaining. Um, it, it follows his uh, usual um, taking taking characters that appear briefly in some story or another and then fleshing them out. It's the studies of Dr. Reed. Uh, so I think that was really, really fun. And there are many other good stories in here. So... Whoever gets this is quite lucky. I'll be happy to autograph it. I can uh, have my son autograph it too, or the postman. Uh, yeah, it, this is available on Kindle too, right? Yeah. Kindle too. All right. So it's available now on Amazon. So let's do introductions and then, then we'll, we'll chat. We don't have a guest today, um, but we will next week. Uh, Mark Severson. I hope I'm saying that last name correctly next week. Uh, anyway, I'm Mike Davis with Lovecraft Ezine. Uh, again, thanks for all the notes that everyone sent. If you want to email the show, it's lovecraftezine at gmail.com. You wouldn't believe the number of emails I got from people saying, yes, Kelly is humble. I'm not making this up. I got, must have at least got half a dozen emails saying, Sock yeah, puppets all right. those were sent by Kelly himself. <laughs> That's right. Just, just restating how humble I was. It's an ex example of uh, fake news. Yes, <laughs> it's like the Russian. The, the, he's using Russian methods to. Uh, I'm just going to say that Kelly, I'm a million times humbler than thou art. <laughs> oh wow! All right, uh, Pete, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Pete Rollick, and I write, I edit, I dabble in dark arts, and you fish. A fish, fish. Yes, I fish. Yeah, PeteRollick.com, not PeterRollick.com. Only one R in the middle, and that'll take you to his Amazon page. Yes, where hopefully there'll be a few new books out there soon. Yeah, uh, Matt, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Matt Carpenter. I sometimes edit anthologies for Ulthar Press. The latest one is wow, this Bigman's Gallery. Yep. Yep. Uh, Kelly. I'm Kelly Young. I am the executive editor of Strange Eons Magazine, and I also am the co-host of the Dead Again podcast, where we discuss genre film, television, shit like that. Yeah, Hector Plasmic is watching live. Uh, I guess we are getting the usual amount watching live. Thanks, folks. Uh, you're either already home from Thanksgiving or you blew off your family just so you can watch it live. <laughs> uh, Hector says, hey, Kelly, binged listen to the last three dead again episodes out in the woods on thursday night that seems like the perfect place to listen to it to me you forgot thank you hector you forgot to ask me to introduce myself i'm sorry uh yes i did i'm who are you yeah i'm rick lay a writer who dabbles in idolatry 
<laughs> As you can see by all the Cthulhu statues behind me. Uh, and I'm sorry, Rick. I uh, I don't know. I'm out of it today. Let's, what can I say? I'm getting old. That's right. No problem. Um, yeah, Rick and I just recorded a, a pretty interesting Patreon podcast uh, before the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, Fictional Master Criminals. So that was a fun listen. Uh, okay. When will that be available? It's available now. Oh, excellent. Uh, if you're a Patreon. I said I, I emailed it to you. What, 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 what? I know. I'm I'm way behind on these because I that when you email it to me, I got to download it. I got to get it to my tin horn that I listen what, to. I'm going to give you the password to my Patreon, and you can do that for me. Okay. Since you, since you know what to do. All right. Uh, but yes, it's important, but it's at the bottom of the list. So. Which means not important well the opposite I, of i important. placed it under all the family health issues let's put it that way okay all right uh if you want to be a patron you can do so lovecraft just google lovecraft easy and patreon should be the first link that comes up and the minimum's five dollars a month and like i always say that's less than a meal at mcdonald's and it's only once a month and you know, five bucks isn't much, but you know, if a, if a bunch of people are doing it, it really helps me out. Speaking of helping people out and a little bit going a long way, if you can only give a little bit, um, super channel. Um, Joe Pulver is had to go had to go into the hospital. He's now back home from the hospital. For all the listeners who don't know this. Um, I talked to him. I video called him Thanksgiving Day, and he's he was able to talk and doing okay. But you know, he said he was giddy from being home from the hospital, so that's a good thing. He he hates being there, but he's in really poor health, and you know his wife is in very poor health. I don't know if it was a stress related event or what that caused her to get have some serious health problems right after Joe did. I'm sure it had to be at least somewhat stress related, but you know, um, their, their income has been drastically reduced. You know, not only are they both in, in terrible health right now dealing with that, but then you pile on a low income. It's, it's a very stressful situation. Uh, they do have a GoFundMe. Um, I linked to it, uh, already, even if you're watching live, it's it's linked in the show comments, uh, show notes. Excuse me. Um, you know, of course, you can also just Google uh, Joe Pulver GoFundMe, but this will take you right there. Um, like I said, even if you could only like send them three bucks, anything's going to help them. Uh, they really could use the help, and and frankly, they deserve the help. Something really hit me the other day. You know, the Facebook memories thing that you get every day. It's, a, you know, I'm sure everyone knows what I'm talking about. And it showed me a Facebook memory from one year ago. This was on the 17th, where I had posted something to the effect of, um, at long last, here's a, here's a big surprise. Joe Pulver is going to be uh, on the show today. And I thought, man, it really hits home how long Joe has been going through this. Because it was a year ago that he was able to do several podcasts over the course of a of a couple of months with us. You know, if, and those of you who are new may not know that uh, new listeners may not know that Joe did this with us every week before he got sick. Uh, and it really hit it home. It's it, it's been a year since then, and it was months and months and months before that that he actually got sick. So I don't know. He's got to be creeping on a year and a half, maybe closing on two years that he's since since this happened and in all of that time joe has not been able to do two of the things that he loves most in the world read and write uh joe's a great writer he's not been able to write because he can't see very well at all and he's not been able to read for the same reason so you know, like I said, I linked to their GoFundMe in the show notes. If you can help them out, 
if you can send them a, a lot of money, if you if you're a person that's lucky enough to make a big income and you can send them fifty or hundred bucks, do that. If you're like me and you make hardly anything, you know, and you can only send them two bucks, do that. It would it would really help them out. So uh, thanks for bearing with me on that. But I just they're going through so much and they're part of our community and they've they've given so much to our community, you know. So anyway. Um, winners of the Call of Cthulhu game, Lincoln Brown, Alan Smalling, and Hector Plasmic. So, you guys will have to let me know what you think of the game. And Hector, I think you were going to play it with your, with your son, so you'll have to tell me what he thinks, too. So, all right. Uh, Stan Lee passed away. That's terrible. Yeah, I mean, not exactly a shock. He was 95, but but still sad. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like he, uh, like we hadn't heard from him lately, and we were just finding out, oh, man, the guy that created Spider-Man died. This guy's been in every single Marvel movie in a cameo, you know, for the last 10 years. So everyone's pretty familiar with him. Yeah, 95 years old. Um I hope I'm as good as in his as good of health as he was at 95. Um, but it's still, yeah, very sad, and it's a loss to the comic book community. When, and uh, yeah, Rick. You know, say when he died, I realized I probably read because I I grew up in the 60s. I probably read more by him than any other living writer or any other writer in. Oh wow! Who, That's a good uh, point. Yeah, so I was reading. I guess about 20 Marvel comics came out of a month. And I was reading all of them from like 65 to uh, 70. Well, and some people did not miss the opportunity. Uh, some people even that we know on Facebook didn't miss the opportunity to uh, uh, diss Stan Lee right off the bat. Uh, uh, yeah, on the day he died. The guy has a complicated yeah. legacy. But maybe you wait until the day after he dies to bring all that shit up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's incredible, and uh, not least of which, uh, Bill Maher. I think we all know about his comments. Uh, here's how he's he's simplified this, and can I even say dumbed it down? Bill Maher quote: "The guy who created Spider-Man, the Hulk, has died, and America is in mourning." Deep, deep mourning for a man who inspired millions to, I don't know, watch a movie, I guess. Uh, really, it's, it's, that's what you think Stan Lee was all about? Yeah, I mean, it's part partly what he was about, sure. But he inspired people to imagine. He inspired, he, he yeah, you were having a hard life. As a kid, you could pick up a Stan Lee comic and escape into that world for for a while, you know, and uh, I don't know. You guys can throw in any comments here you want, but well, it's just what, what I think more doesn't realize is that comic books can be a gateway drug into reading. Absolutely. I mean, that's why I read uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. I learned about it from uh, reading Marvel comics. That was more Roy Thomas than Stan Lee, but it's, it's yeah. That's what happens. Yeah, and and not just in the reading, but in in a lot of ways, it's a gateway to science. I mean, the first time I read about mutation or the idea of alternate worlds or um, radio radiation is in Spider Man, the Fantastic Four, and the X Men. I mean, it's not just a gateway to reading; it's a gateway to science fiction, and it's a gateway to science. Yeah, and he. Yeah. And here, Peter Parker, as a as a teenager, he's really, really interested in science. You know, I remember reading those comic books growing up and thinking how cool that was. You know, it's not just that Peter Parker could climb walls and fight crime, but he could also he also created the web stuff that he swung from. Uh, you know, 
uh, Stan Lee, here's a guy who came up with sayings like, with great power comes great responsibility. You know? Uh, so I just, I don't, I don't get the, the diss in the guy, uh, especially right as he's died, as, as he, soon as he finished dying, well, you know? I, I'm going to go oh, out on the limb. My brain is really off today. Yeah, go ahead, Pete. I'm going to go out on the limb, and, and I think Rick will, will back me up in here. As, as the comics progress and you move into, say, Doctor Strange and, you know, Jack Kirby starts going crazy with giving a free hand on the Eternals. Mm -hmm. Um and then outside of Marvel, but in, into DC, you're seeing explorations of philosophy, of, 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 of a wide variety of ideas, and looking at things that aren't really talked about until you get into college. Nietzscheism and 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 you know this, what Steve Ditko did with you know uh, Mr. A and uh, the question. These are these are heroes that have very bizarre and unusual moral philosophies, and they're translated to comic books really well. So it's not just it, it's it's not the I would say wasteland of ideas that some people think. There's a lot going on in comics. Yeah, and there can be. You know, this gets into the whole issue of like um, uh, people being snobs in favor of their own particular art form. Yeah. Because you know that, well, I, you know, the requirements are different, but the enjoyment from classical music compared to bluegrass compared to jazz, it's, it's really for the person participating or enjoying the art to tell you whether it's got worth or not. What, what I've come to realize over the years is there's many ways to tell a story and they've got strengths and weaknesses and we're just used to like reading a novel, but you can go to a, a performance of My Fair Lady and that's a completely different experience or you go to a movie and the film's a different experience than seeing it on stage. A comic book is just a different way of storytelling and there's nothing that makes it invalid uh, it's like nowadays it's like it's it's all changing you, you can tell a story through a video game right but people who will diss comic books um mostly i think they're being snobbish you know it, it's easy enough to say okay well i don't like it i don't get it but you enjoy it so you enjoy it what do i i don't know what's wrong with saying that there isn't anything wrong with it. And, you know, Bill Maurer's not a dumb guy. And I wonder, does he really believe this? Or is he just trying to make it about himself again and stir up controversy, you know, create drama? I don't know. I, I think that's all this is, really. I don't think he could possibly really believe that. Uh, although, to Matt's point, he is a professional snob. Mm -hmm. So... But I think that this was a, a shock jock kind of thing to do. Just say something that would get people talking. And, and everybody did for a while. Well, can you imagine the impact if you were an African-American kid in 1966, picking up the Fantastic Four, reading about the Black Panther? Mm, yeah. First black superhero? African yeah. superhero? I mean, uh, at the time, I um, don't want to this totally, but you know, you got most of your, your view of Africa generally came from Tarzan, which could have been improved. <laughs> you know, it reminds me of um, people dissing on Star Trek, which at its core is just a TV show, right? Quote unquote, or at least it used to be, or just movies. But you know, in the 60s, here we got an African American female on the bridge of the ship and that inspired so many african-american women you know i've read story after story about that the famous story is that she wanted to quit and do something else and martin luther king himself called her and said no don't quit don't quit the show it's too important yeah 
Yeah, but it's yeah. It's, sure, mean, it's means simple. of it's means of a narrative telling the story that you need out there. You can be simplistic or snobbish and say, "Well, it's just a TV show." I don't watch TV. I'm much too intelligent. I read books, you know. But you know, she she inspired a lot of people by, you know, with that acting gig. So also, Star Trek was the first TV show to comment on the Vietnam War. Comment on what? I'm sorry. The Vietnam War. Oh, right. Which is what one of the best episodes of television I ever saw was a private little war. And I remember being this if you were a kid watching that, you thought this would have a nice, neat resolution to the plot. And it ended on a note of the hero Kirk really didn't know what he should do. Which is what Vietnam was to a large extent. Um, kind of a quagmire, and you can't figure out how to get out. One of the issues with my chronic illness is is a kind of a brain fog sometimes, and I'm, and I'm dealing with it today more than usual. So I really apologize about if I'm stumbling over my words or if I say something twice. But uh, I don't know if I said this already. Hector Plasmic, watching the live so show, said, uh, "Right, Stan made teenagers feel like they belong to something bigger than themselves." Sounds silly, but it wasn't. So, you know, I don't know. He's going to be missed, you know. And we're a story storytelling species, and that was his medium for telling stories. And he made a very positive impact on the world. And was he a perfect person? No, but uh, he made a huge impact. And who is? Well, well, all well. <laughs> I set myself up for that one. <laughs> I, I was going to say my wife. What did you? Oh, okay. I was going to say. <laughs> oh, you thought I was going to say me? I was positive you were going to say you. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Stan Lee, rest in peace, and thanks for everything. Uh, I was thinking about something. Pete, you've said something on this show several times over the years um, about alternate realities, alternate universes, and, you know, um, an alternate, alternate universe coming into being when a person makes choice A as opposed to choice B. You've also talked about, um, you know, if it's an extremely minimal impact, you know, then do those two universes collapse in on one, on one another? Uh, can you talk about that for just a second? And then I've got a question that I want to ask you about it. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's funny because uh, somebody was just talking about this in reference to Salome the other day. Oh, okay. Um, and, and asked me to chime in and do the exact same thing. So the idea is that, you know, we have this, there's this theory of, of diverging universes where um, every decision that somebody can make or event that can be made in a different way creates a different universe. And what I've postulated is this idea that at some point, universes that have diverged become close enough together, similar enough together that they don't have any reason to stay apart. So they collapse back into each other. Um, so if you can imagine, say, that you're out camping in the woods and in one universe you hear a cricket and in the other uh, universe you don't, and this goes on in your separate universes for 60 years, but then you die. And now nobody was, who was around remembers that cricket or the lack of that cricket. Does it matter anymore? No. And it doesn't. Yeah. So then what keeps these two universes apart if that's the only difference? So my idea would be that they would collapse back together, conserving you know energy or mass or what whatnot. Um, but the more I think about this is, is like, okay, so now imagine that it's a billion years from now and the earth is destroyed, but it's destroyed in a billion different ways on, in different universes. Mm -hmm. And then 
another million years goes by and it doesn't really matter how it was destroyed, the outcomes were the same. So all these universes start collapsing back into each other. Um, the first it, thing I don't get with this is, is I can see parallel realities where different beings make different choices. Sure. But what I don't, what is hard to follow for me is another universe being created because in one universe, I turned left instead of turning right. Now there's a un new universe where I turned right. Yes. That, that seems kind of hard to swallow. No, it's just an idea. Yeah, no, I, I and that's it's not my idea. talking about ideas. <laughs> yeah. No, and um, I know that too. So yeah, uh, yeah. I, I well, just didn't know. Am I missing something here? No, or? no you're not missing anything. It's okay. it's an idea that people have. Um, okay, so so let's tie it back to Lovecraftiana for a second. Peter Kleins, the guy who wrote that really nice novel fourteen, wrote a novel called The Fold, mm -hmm. where. Um, it turns out uh, they are intersecting with these other universes through technology and not realizing it. Um, just, just there is a a really kind of neat Lovecraftian novel if someone's interested in this, which sort of hints around at this issue. The fold is what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and fourteen was Lovecraftian as well. Yeah, I love 14. I haven't read The Fold yet. I haven't either. But yeah, I did like 14. Worth a look. Worth a look. Uh, so here's my question, Pete, then. Yeah. Uh, assuming this happens, why should only human choices matter? I mean, if an ant is going to go this way in one universe, and then on another universe it goes the opposite way, is that the same thing, or is it only sentient beings? Making it's, choices. It's, a, it's a good question and I actually have an idea for a story where there's a whole bunch of aliens there's an a, a alien uh, race looking in or, or on earth and they're basically actually they're just outside of our solar system and they're like swiping through all the different versions of earth that they could contact because our choices only really impacted us in, in, until we join the rest of the community of the galaxy. We're still sort of like in, a, a cat in Schrodinger's box. Right. Uh, we don't, it, it's, we have potential. So they're sort of like swiping left. <laughs> constantly looking for, <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, we, yeah, we know we're going to pass on Nazi earth and we're going to pass on American earth and we're going to pass on this, I, you know, the Jewish earth, that, that one looks pretty good. We might take that one. Yeah. And it, so they take that one. It, it's like, so they come down to, you know, like, they have to decide which earth they're going to let join their version of the, of the universe, their timeline. This, this reminds me of a, a short story by Isaac Asimov. Rick may remember it. It was um, basically they, they learned how to like go into all these different alternate Earths, and they were, it was getting to the point where there were, there were so many out on the hinterlands where human life didn't evolve that each family on Earth got to have their own private planet. And... <laughs> And then uh, they started getting their own private Mars or their own private Venus. And eventually they stumbled on what it ended. They, there were, um, life had evolved on Venus in this particular reality. And uh, they had hypothesized that if it had happened, it would be much more intelligent and vicious and more survival minded than a friendly planet like Earth. It's just, so the end of the story was they're looking outside their bubble and there are these hideous creatures looking in at them. They should they should do a TV show about you know sliding through parallel dimensions. That yeah, would cool. that would be fun, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you could almost get home, almost. Almost. Right. right. Uh. Yeah. So. So the, to answer your question is like you, know, um, it might not matter 
because the memories of small creatures are relatively short. Um, because maybe time is subjective rather than objective. But it'd be an interesting idea to play around with. I just have a question for everybody. What was your first exposure to the parallel world concept? That's a great question because I've been interested in it since I was a kid and I just don't remember the answer. No, for me, it goes back to Stan Stephen Lee with, uh, with the What If comics. Oh, it goes back, to, I go before you, DC Comics with uh, Earth 1, Earth 2 in uh, Justice League and the Flash. Yeah. Garner and Fox. Yeah, I, I would have. I don't know. I've been reading science fiction and fantasy, you know, like my whole life. Like, you know, like The Wizard of Oz. It's like, it's been around for a long time. I just can't even remember what my first exposure would have been. You guys, I'm sure all of you read Ur, right? By Stephen King. Short story Ur. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you like that one, Kelly? I know you're a big Stephen King fan. Yeah, I did enjoy that one. That was a neat um, little, it was only available as a Kindle download at first because they were using it to promote the Kindle. In fact, it was the first thing I downloaded when I got my Kindle. Yeah, it was really early in the Kindle days. <laughs> so uh, I recently listened to that again on Audible, and, you know, it actually it holds up pretty well. It's a great story. Anyone who out there who hasn't read Ur, you are, you should. So Yeah, and it ties into the Dark Tower stories, too. All things serve the tower. Or something like that, right? Serve the beam. <laughs> Um, well, all right. The other thing that doesn't make sense to me, Pete. Okay. And I, I know this is all geek stuff, but that's why we're here, right? Um, so supposedly in an infinite multiverse, anything that can happen will happen at some point in the multiverse, right? Um, because it is infinite. Well, I've never really bought that because just because it's infinite doesn't mean it has to repeat itself in every single conceivable pattern, right? You're staring at me blankly for those. No, I, I'm not. I just, I just try to. Okay, so well, okay, you know, with quantum mechanics, everything is probabilistic, right? You know, so it is possible that in one. Mm, fraction of a nanosecond, all your molecules in your whole body could move in the same direction and levitate you off the ground two feet. The probability is vanishingly small for such an occurrence. So, uh, you know, if you're really talking about an infinite number of possibilities, then sure, there's going to be, there is a probability that every single everything could have occurred. But that's like getting into the concept of real concept of infinity. Then I'm going to go watch football again instead. Thanks. <laughs> but but no. But Matt makes a good point: is that yes, maybe in an infinite number of universes or continuums, um, it's possible. The problem is that you'd have to start exploring all of them to find it, and your chances of finding it are infinitely small. Well, I'm less interested in finding it than just figuring out if it's really out there or not. I mean, is there... So, so like, there's a universe where I was successful. Vanishingly it's small, one. I think. Oh, okay. it's probably it's one. one. Just checking. Oh, my God. Uh, so, Are you we know... we the simulation, boys? According to this, there's a universe out there where there really is a Krypton that exploded and Superman was sent to Earth. I mean, I just don't buy it. You know? Well, yeah, under the no, no, you're talking about in all probability. That's not a probability because if you were, if your planet was evolving on the outer uh, outer limit of the orbit of a, a red giant, the idea that you would have humanoid-looking life is is just preposterous. 
I just well, don't. I it's, just, it's, it's, not prepos- it's, it's not preposterous if you assume that somebody in a civilization a long time ago seeded the galaxy with with humanoids. Okay, no, I actually read something. We're getting way off the mark. Okay. We have uh, a mark. If a, if, a, if a planet fragments and uh, certain forms of life are contained, say, within a portion of the fragment, let's just let's say a, a tardigrade. Is that what they're called? Or <laughs> some kind of uh, low metabolism, simple bacterium, then later on in space when this collects all this matter recollects uh, around some star and coalesces into a planet again supposedly this life form could have been preserved and therefore you can argue considering the age of the universe is say 15 billion years and the age of our star is 5 billion years and this has happened multiple times that there could be DNA that seeded multiple planets through natural processes. I mean, it's not completely out of the realm of speculation. But otherwise, you know, the the idea that you're going to, I mean, the whole idea that you're going to take something from another biosystem, and we've got, we're living in a film of bacteria that extends from the deepest depths of the earth up into the upper atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We're going to be removed from that bacterial film and that we're going to thrive on another world and then be able to go and see it's like this just gets to be again where i find the distances and uh restrictions of actual travel in space all the um floating iron atoms that can just go straight through any all these pretend star trek shields and stuff then riddle your dna to mince meat oh I just, yeah it's and it's amazing the people who you know, that think that don't realize that space travel is that hard. You know, well, we went to the moon, we'll go to other stars, you know, sometime in the next century, too. It's like, I, I think if someone uh, actually goes to Mars and spends like 21 months essentially unshielded, even if you're taking the strong, strongest antioxidants possible, you're probably, if you make it back alive, it's an unforgiving environment. If you make it back alive, you're probably doomed to either Alzheimer's or cancer as a result of that exposure to unshielded from cosmic rays. You know, Mars doesn't have the atmosphere. Your little space capsule doesn't have the atmosphere. Nothing can shield you from the iron atoms. Yeah, it's space travels not easy would be an understatement. Uh, well, that's one of the reasons I like the, the film Europa. Yeah. It, you know, space travel is dangerous, long, and boring. And everything that will can go wrong will go wrong. And you know we don't see enough of that in film. Yeah, you know, you know, Kevin's going to make a mistake, mistake, or fall asleep at the stick and open up oh, the yeah. doors or something. You know, Kevin. We, you know, we we romanticize astronauts as as sort of these guys that are like um, like Han Solo. They're speed freaks and daredevils and and really giant risk takers but what they what the really good ones are are people who are very task oriented who are mm-hmm. willing to willing to do be comfortable doing the same thing day after day hour after hour minute after minute following checklists yeah was it wasn't that the theme of the right stuff yeah in that you know a test pilot is the wrong type of person to be an astronaut yeah. Maybe, but they, they again. That's that's also romanticized because all pilots are trained to engage in these pre-flight checklists. Uh, as, you know, in the military, it's like they they everybody has their pre-flight checklist that they have to go through, and there are multiple inspection steps. And uh, I know that the commercial pilots do this too. So I, I think even a test pilot would be the kind of person who would. Because your life, you're, you're putting your hands in the life of this machine. You're going to make sure everything's been triple checked properly. Still, and, still you can't be, and you can't be claustrophobic either. Yeah. Uh, getting back to the infinite universes thing, let, let's make it a bit of a simpler example. In one universe, Mike Davis runs a site called the Lovecraft Easing. In another universe, um, 
I work at a factory, okay? Um, so if there's an infinite number of, of universes, that means there's an infinite, you know, there, there's a universe where I'm an astronaut, and there's, an inf there's a universe where I'm this, that, and the other. And, you know, the hypothesis basically is that if it is possible, then it's happening out in the multiverse somewhere which is something I just don't buy it. And maybe I'm missing something, Pete, but, um, well, what you could be describing is, is, you know, you're talking about there's an infinite set of possibilities, but maybe there isn't maybe like depicted say in Marvel universe or even the DC television universe in the Marvel universe, all Reed Richards become scientists. Mm -hmm. They're different kinds of scientists. They're diff They're good. They're evil. They have different technologies, but they almost always become scientists. In the DC television universe, uh, what's his name? Wells always becomes a scientist um, in varying states of quality. So, you know, there's a possibility that we're missing a factor here and that that factor is an individual's potential is not infinite, but rather limited or directed. Yeah. So I will always be a mediocre scientist and a mediocre writer. <laughs> I wouldn't say you're a mediocre writer. I don't know how much of a scientist you are. <laughs> and, well, yeah. there's also the concept they get back to what Mike said before about you know there being some parallel world where Krypton exists. That you as a writer, Pete, are releasing mental energy and you are creating a universe that can be reached somehow where your characters exist. Yeah. And all those dreams. And didn't Farmer do some of that those stories? Well, DC did that with uh Crisis on Infinite Earths, Barry Allen um, read about a scientist. He read, read comic books about a scientist as, as a kid whose name was Jay Garrick. He was yes. the Flash. You know, and when he became the Flash, he, he found out that there actually was an alternate universe where Jay Garrick really did exist. So, anyway, it's fun to talk about, but like the weather what are you going to do about it uh this isn't genre related but i've got to talk about this just for a second because i'm so happy about it um tom cruise will be replaced as jack reacher for a, for the tv reboot they're not going to there's not going to be any more tom cruise jack reacher movies so. right, lee, lee childs has finally admitted that 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 uh, Tom Cruise is quote too short. <laughs> well, you know he's not bad in his action movies, but he's past the age where he should be like the young action hero star. I don't know. I, I the Jack Reacher movies for me were always just okay. Have you read the books? Yeah, I read like I don't know four or five of them for airplane reads at one point or another. Well, Cruise isn't playing Jack Reacher from the books. He's playing Ethan Hunt in a different situation, basically. Point. I would argue those movies might not have even been made, though, if Cruz hadn't latched himself onto them. Uh, I don't know. Lee Childs is a pretty popular author. Yeah, but I remember they were trying for a long time to get that off the ground, and nothing was happening until Tom Cruise was attached. And I think that he had the star power to make it happen. I really enjoyed that first movie. I thought the second one was a turd, but... Uh, I've never read the books. Yeah, I always I was, thought I that the be... character was uh, awfully similar to Repairman Jack. Yeah, very true. Suspiciously similar. F. Paul Wilson is <laughs> going to be on the show. I wonder if we should ask him that on air or not. We I think we should. We, we should look up. Uh, I'm not sure when the first Jack Reacher was written. Uh, 90s, I believe. Mid 90s. Right, so like that. Repairman Jack came in the 80s. Yeah. So anyway, you know, Reacher's like what six foot five, and he's he's described as a mountain of a man, basically. Well, you know, 
I, I haven't seen the Jack Reacher films. I read the books. But there are adaptations where you get an actor who looks nothing like the character in the books but captures the spirit. True. Sean Connery is James Bond. James Bond doesn't look anything like Sean Connery. If he probably... Um, Timothy Dalton was sort of almost close to the way Bond was described in the books. But he's really just could be a skinny... If you ever met... He was, James Bond was a skinny guy. You, 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 more like David Niven who was in a parody of uh, Bond, Casino Royale, the original version. And that's a good point. Uh, I just don't feel like Cruz captured the spirit of Reacher either. Yeah. And I would say Connery captured the spirit of Bond. Christopher Lee's Dracula looked nothing like Dracula in the book. Right. But he captured the spirit of Dracula more than Bela Lugosi. So I'm look anyway, I'm looking forward to the TV reboot and um, hopefully it'll be good. What's that going to be on? Uh, I don't know, actually. But not Netflix or anything like that, then. By the way, did, did any sure. of you watch the uh, um, Tom Clancy miniseries or TV show that was starring <laughs> the guy from The Office? Jack Ryan? I, yeah. I watched a couple episodes, and I, I didn't... I, I, I didn't like it. Yeah, I didn't think the... The main character was charismatic enough to carry it off. He just, it's just, it didn't ring well for me. Like, I don't think that was a good portrayal of the character on the screen. Yeah, I feel the same. I, I think the best um, actor who played that role was uh, Alec Baldwin, honestly. The Hunt for Red October? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think Harrison Ford basically played Harrison, Harrison Ford. Ford. <laughs> you know, not not Jack Ryan. Um, but yeah, anyway, so enough of that. Um, what do you guys? What do you, I'm going to ask you guys what you're reading right now? Before I do that, or or I've read recently. Um, before I do that. Um, what do you guys think about rereading? I was talking with someone the other day, and he said that he rarely rereads anything. Um, and I replied that I reread things a lot. You know, if I really love the world of that book, I want to experience it again, I'll reread it um, at some point in the future. So, you know, I understand the concept. You only have a limited number of books you can read in the rest of your life um so it's it's not to me it's not a right or a wrong thing i was just I, curious about I you like guys. to reread stuff i mean did you ever read the wheel of time books this is a series a fantasy series that started like in 1990 and eventually collapsed under its own weight and the author died with like four or five books still to go and there ended up being like maybe 20 books in the series when that first came out, it was really intriguing, and it's when the internet was first getting going, and there were lots of hidden clues in the first few books that, that like basically set the message boards like crazy. You remember alt.horror.cthulhu? Yeah. This is alt.sf.written.rj or something like that for Robert Jordan, the guy who was the, the pseudonym of the guy who wrote the, the book. When that came out, I would actually – if a new book was coming out, which was coming out pretty frequently, like every year, every other year, I'd start at book one and I'd read all the way through so I was fresh for the new book until things just got so lengthy, complex, and bad, I just gave it up. And then I gave all my books away, and then I just gave up on it. Um, but, yeah, I, I like rereading. I'll, I'll still – Pull out a collection of Lovecraft stories and reread The Outsider or something like that. I enjoy it. What about the rest of you? I used to reread when I was younger a lot. I'd, I'd read The Shining, you know, maybe every other year or Dan Simmons' Summer of Night. Uh, as I got older, 
You've reread just... Summer of Night a lot? Oh, yeah. Many, many so, times. That's so funny. So have I. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as I got older, and maybe because I had more disposable income, I was able to buy you know, more books and not have to read what was st still in my library. And at this point now, I'm, I, I feel kind of guilty if I reread something because I have a to-be-read pile that is just out of control. And, and if I start reading something that I know I love, I'm just like, oh, boy, I really should be spending this time reading one of these books that a friend has written or something like that. And on the other hand, Robert Price gave this really good quote once for his Lovecraftian reading was at the point now, and his library was at the point where he thought he could start over at the beginning, rereading, not remembering anything that he had read before because it had been so much of the stuff that he had read. It's interesting, Kelly, that you talk about feeling guilty if you reread a book because if I understand you right, you feel like you should be reading, you know, you've got a huge TBR pile and you should be reading something off of that. You know, yeah. I, I, I can understand that, but um, really what it boils down to is you want to be immersed in a story and if, if, if you know, in a world. And if there's a world that you really love uh, in, in a book or a set of books, I mean, why not? You know, you're, you know, life's too short. It's not a race to see how many books you can read, really. It is for me. Well, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Competitive, I forgot. I'm sorry. The problem I have is is not that I don't want to reread the books, but one of two things happens: either I reread it and I discover that I had missed all the double entendres <laughs> that I was not educated enough to understand when I first read the book, or I'll read it and I go, damn, this this really sucks. Yeah, that, that happens to me sometimes too. You go back and read something and you're like, oh, my tastes have obviously changed dramatically since yeah. the first time I read this. <laughs> well, if you read a series, sometimes you reread it for continuity. If you made it out of notice, because you didn't know where this was going. And you notice foreshadowing and hints and... Uh, Minor characters when they first pop up, but you didn't realize. Oh, he, oh, he, he was a throwaway line in uh, the first book. And you also catch, you may catch some discontinuity errors, and revised continuity. Yeah. And the one thing, like when I, I reread uh, Doc Savage, which was uh, 181 novels. And I noticed things, because I was a more educated reader than when I was reading them when they were coming out in uh, 1960 paperbacks. I'm suddenly realizing this villain is based on a real life person from the 1930s. And there's more political commentary in Doc Savage than anybody ever imagined. You know what, Rick? I, I didn't get to all 180. I read like 70 of them. And I read, I reread them when I was a kid, 10 years old. I don't know. I didn't know Kenneth Robeson wasn't a real person. So I didn't, I didn't when, I, when I found that out, I was so bitterly disappointed. I didn't know uh, Franklin W. Dixon wasn't a real person either. Yeah, I, I, I had much. <laughs> well, what, 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 popularized that is when, you know, this bio I got back into Doc Savage when the uh, Philip Jose Former wrote his biography, his fictional biography of Doc Savage, the first reading, oh, oh, these are all written by a guy named Lester Dent, or mostly written by a guy named Lester Dent. And that was a big shock. You know, I'll, I'll sit in my living room um, sometimes, and I've got one, two, three four, about five bookshelves worth of print books in here. You know, that doesn't even count all my Kindle books. But I sit there in my easy chair and I'll look at them sometimes and I'll think it, how, I think we forget to be astonished sometimes It's at the little things in life and amazed 
at the little things. And I and I look at all those books and I think inside of each one of those is a is an entire world, entire universe. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's books are just wonderful things and we love them because we grew up as a storytelling species, you know, kill the time round the fire. So, uh, what have you guys been reading lately or what are you in the middle of right now? Um, while you're looking, I'll go ahead and talk to you about, I'm re I'm rereading, speaking of rereading, I'm rereading re a Matthew Scudder book, uh, title of it is the devil knows you're dead um by lawrence block i'm reading for the first time a book called uh the uncanny by andrew clavin k-l-a-v-a-n and i'm really enjoying it it's uh sort of a gothic ghost story type type thing so and uh, reading a couple of nonfiction books that I can't remember the titles of right now. And then, Pete, I think you would be very interested in this. Have you read this? Uh, it's um, For those listening later, I'm holding up Superman and Batman Generations Imaginary Tale. So, have you read this, Pete? Uh, n you've mentioned that to me last week. Oh, did I? And, okay. Um, I have set it aside to read um i recently uh picked up a thousand comics at a store that was trying to get rid of them so i'm you need my address no i don't uh <laughs> because uh, there was a complete run of sandman a complete run of the first 200 issues of saga of swamp thing oh my goodness wow um, the first 50 issues of Spawn. And an Action Comics number one, which is no, why he gave no, his notice no. the other day I, at work. No, there was, there's only one Superman comic in there, though, but you know, I'm um, reveling in going through this stuff. I bet. That sounds you know, great. My family is pissed because I have stacks of boxes <laughs> all over the house. Comic books take up a lot of space. Yeah. yeah. I buy a lot, of, a lot of digital comics these days. So. Um, on, and I'm currently negotiating with my local comic shop for, you know, selling some of the more interesting pieces. Well, if you are a fan of Superman and or Batman, this is something you should definitely pick up. It's it's John Byrne. Uh, John Byrne wrote it. And it starts at 1939 with Superman and Batman's first meeting. And goes all the way, I don't want to spoil anything, but it goes all the way up to uh, about 700 years from now, I believe it is. I, I read, um, I don't know if there was more than one generation series, but I at least read the first one when it came out in the original comic books. Yeah, it's Which, it's really good. The one that ended with uh, Lana Lang was, I think, in the last issue. Yes, that's that was the last issue. And I, I, I love what happened in that last issue, and I'm I kind of ache to talk about it. You know, my inner geek would love to talk about it, but I don't want to give it away. So well, all we, I can we'll, say is pick it up. <laughs> we won't give it away, but just so people understand the premise a little better. Yes. What it is is if Superman and Batman really aged and like what happened in the like the multiple generations of Batman and uh, Superman has descendants. And if those things, you know, like if it was an 80s version of Batman that wasn't the original Bruce Wayne, but they had all this stuff that happened to him in the comics was, let's say, Ray Al Ghul or whatever happens to this version of Batman. And it's remarkable how he mixes in various things, like uh, the death of Robin is not quite the death of Robin that we know. But he did some really, it was really brilliant storytelling. Yes, it was. Uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. So that's, 
I just finished that, and that's that's what I'm working on right now. What about you guys? What have you finished recently? What are you in the middle of? What do you want to recommend that you've read recently? I've got three books. Sure, go ahead. I read The Way of the Worm by Ramsey Campbell, which is the uh, completion of his trilogy, Three Births of Dayloth, which you have a review. Uh, you publish a review by someone whose name I don't remember, unfortunately, on uh, Lovecraft Ezine. They didn't want to read the review until I read the book. And uh, that is... Uh, Excellent book by Campbell, and you don't have to be a Cthulhu Mythos geek to enjoy it. And I've also dug up a Gardner F. Fox paperback called Terra Over London, which is his version of the Jack the Ripper story, which is a pretty adult book for Gardner F. Fox. He was right in the 50s, he was writing uh, historical novels in paperback before he ended up going into DC Comics. And the third one we had discussed a little before the show was The Dark Other by Stanley Weinbaum, which is a science fiction novel involving split personalities, may have influenced Stephen King's The Dark Half, as a throwaway Necronomicon. Uh, reference, so it's very much on the periphery of Cthulhu mythos, but really uh, really on the far periphery. It's really not a mythos story by any stretch. Okay. Pete, what are you reading? Or did you get through all your three, Rick? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. So, um, several years ago, Jeff and Ann Vandermeer put out a book called The Weird. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is this huge compilation, international compilation of weird stories. Very well worth the money. Yes. If you don't have it. And I have been slowly walking through that book um, and digesting it. And I came across a story called The Dust Enforcer by Reza Negrestani, which is about Abdul al Hazad. And this strikes me as odd because Jeff is not a big fan of, of Lovecraft and the Cthulhu mythos, but he includes this story and it turns out that it's an excerpt from a novel. And I'm going to put air quotes. Is it, wait, is it available in print? I've it never is. heard of this. It is. Reza Negrestani's novel is called Cyclonopedia. Wow. That was um, reviewed, but uh, there was two ladies that we had on the show. Uh, Ruth Emrys and uh, I can't think of her other name. Uh, let me think for a second. Um, uh, yeah, Ann Pillsworth. In fact, Matt sent me, sent, me, sent, sent me the link for the review of that book. Yeah. So or, it may, or it may have been this, the excerpt from the, because uh, I put that down on like a list of things I got to eventually look up and read. I am reading this and I get through about a page a night. This is like Neil Stevenson wrote Lovecraftian fiction. <laughs> and what, it includes a divergence about how to eat Captain Crunch cereal? Yeah, basically, yes. Uh, there are diagrams and there's all made up characters and images and whatnot. So I am I'm wading through this and I think I need to go to I need to move to Portland or Boulder to maybe gain a better understanding of this book. Um but it's going to take me a while to read it. And then as soon as I finish this, I'm going to pick up uh, Lady from the Black Lagoon and start reading that. It, that hasn't come out yet, has it? My copy I, have, a, I have a proof copy. Rumble. And, uh, and we're going to have her on. And we're going to have her on in May or March. Something. Let me look. 
I haven't heard of this. Uh, March the 3rd, Mallory oh, Romeo. Rick, yeah. Rick, this is way up your alley. Yeah. So, um, Rick, you may have met Mallory O'Mara at one of the Necronomicons. Name sounds um, familiar. She's a, a very bright young lady, um, does excellent book reviews. Um, I think it's called Reading Glasses. And but she, uh, if you see her, you know her because she has usually bright blue hair. Um, but uh, she's a she's attached to some film studios as a as a producer or something like that. Um, but she researched a biography of the woman who uh, designed the creature from the Black Lagoon. That's and. Basically, has turned the whole story around, and where she was marginalized, it turns out that she um, did a lot more work than people thought. So this is nonfiction. This is nonfiction, but it's right up uh, your alley. No, I mean I, I like to get into the, into the behind the scenes stories of making movies. Yeah, um, it's it's not or. Um, You'll have to pre-order it. Uh, Rick's lucky. I've not been able to get a copy yet. I, I can't wait to read it either. Right. Um, and uh, I guess Publishers Weekly has already given it a starred review. Oh, that's great. So, right. Uh, apparently, it's going to be a big book. So, yeah, that's my next book. But I've got to finish this first, and this is going to take me an, at least another month. And it's, it's not that big. So it's just that it's very dense. So, anyway, that's what I'm reading. Matt and Kelly, you guys want to mention any? Before? Yeah, I, I have uh, four books I'm kind of working on. I, I have different books for different places. Like on Kindle currently, I, the only time I read on my Kindle is on if I have a lunch break at work and I got like 20 free minutes. And based on things that were discussed here previously, I'm reading Shadowland. I've never read it before and I am enjoying it. Uh, the fire has just taken place, and they're on the train. Oh, good. So, I love that book. Um, that, that's why I gave it a try. Um, I am reading uh, this really nifty anthology um, called What October Brings, which is Halloween Lovecraftian fiction, edited by Douglas Draw. And uh, this has really got many fine stories in it. I am quite liking it. Uh, and then I guess the last one I'll mention is um, what I'm reading when I have the time is uh, a History of Vietnam uh, by Max Hastings, the notable uh, war author about wars. He wrote a really great book about World War I. And, um, now I'm trying to this Vietnam story history. Kelly, is, are there any that you want to mention? Yeah, uh, much like Matt, I took a page from what we were discussing. I don't know if it was the last episode or maybe the episode before, and I picked up Wester Mead by Scott Thomas. Oh, yeah. Which I'm really enjoying, but it's leaving me, it's very heavy. It's leaving me a little, I don't want to say depressed, but uh, pensive after it, each story. <laughs> it, it's, it's melancholy. It's like Celtic melancholy, like a sad Irish song. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, in between that, I have been reading The Pack by Jason Starr, which was recommended on uh, the last Brett Easton Ellis podcast. He talked about it and how he was trying to turn it into a TV series. It's kind of trashy werewolf romance, I guess you would call it. Um, it's not really grabbing me. But right uh, now, have you read there's lots of gratuitous werewolf sex. <laughs> um, there's lots of gratuitous sex, and it happens to be with humans who can turn into wolves. Oh, that's so. not good. It's it's not very fur, well written. Fur is flying. Yeah, claws are out and fur is flying. Hey, uh, back to Scott for a second. Uh, Westermead, have you read uh, Over the Darkening Fields, which is another Scott Thomas collection? I have not. I I definitely check that one out. I mean, Westermead's great. And I'm sure there are plenty of people who that's their favorite Scott Thomas collection. I personally liked Over the Darkening Fields the best. 
Okay, so. we'll put that on the list. Uh, what I am currently reading right now is Volume 1, Issue 3 of Vastarian. And um, I just finished Brooklyn Wara's story, or Brooke Wara, I think she goes by. And she is just impressing the hell out of me as this young new author that makes me kind of feel like the way I did the first time I picked up uh, Philip Fricasse's Alter or Cody Goodfellow's Radiant Dawn. It's kind of like, oh boy, this person is going to be someone I follow forever. Yeah. So Cool. Uh, are you all caught up on Titans, Kelly? I am. Uh, I, I haven't seen the I've seen them all except for the very latest episode. But I wonder if you've noticed this. Let me just pull it up real quick. Uh, here's the headline. Um, DC starts online poll to decide if Titans Robin lives or dies. T uh, Titans Robin as in Dick Grayson or the Jason Todd Robin? <laughs> it. It's not real clear because it says subtitle is, is Jason Todd about to be out of a job. Um, but then in, in the body of the article, it says one of DC's most iconic characters, Robin parentheses civilian named Dick Grayson is on the chopping block. I got to think it's the Jason Todd one. I can't see them getting rid of the Dick Grayson character. Yeah. He, he is literally the main character in this show. Yeah, and those of you who are old enough to remember will remember that well before the internet was popular, uh, Jason Todd died because there was a, DC did a, what, what was it, a phone-in poll to decide if Jason Todd was going to live or die at the hands of the journal. Yeah, Joker. I mean, the fans hated Jason Todd. Yeah. So I got the feeling seeing him on Titans that, um, you know, that he had a certain amount of time left anyway. Yeah, he definitely plays Jason. That actor plays Jason Todd real well. You know, he's just an arrogant little prick. Yeah, you're just like, boy, I can't wait till he goes. Yeah, wait till you get killed, buddy. <laughs> and, then, and then he'll come back as Red Hood. Right. I, I think the strength of Titans, I'm listening to a lot of people saying, I'm not going to give this my time because it's it's so different than the titans the teen titans i was reading in the 80s and all of that and my feeling is what? yeah first of all those those stories have been told and i feel very much like they're they're taking the ideas of those stories and running with them i feel like they're probably going to have a very similar outcome even if they're taking a winding way to it this is pretty much that story of Raven, you know, when they started the new Teen Titans uh, and Raven and Trigon and all of that was what was kind of pushing the team together. And it's, it's doing that, even though it's not the, the same as the comic book, but really I'm happy. It's not the same. Yeah. I, I just can't imagine anyone who's seen this, not liking it. If you're a comics fan, you know, unless unless you're one of those people who are just like, well, it's too dark. I want comics to be fun again. I think the show is very fun, but it is very dark. It's it's structured like a horror film. That's great. If you want if you want a DC series that's light, watch Supergirl or The Flash. I mean, it you it is out there for you to consume. That's true. You know. So, so yeah. Apparently, there's a there's an online poll. I I don't know. I don't really know who any of these actors are, but that guy that played Robin, that plays Dick Grayson, uh, there's the scene of him driving in the car with, with Jason Todd, and he's he's realizing that Batman has had another Robin for a year now, and he didn't know anything about it. And just the look on his face, you know, portrayed all of the betrayal he was feeling, and he's so badly wanted to be out from under the shadow of Batman, but then finding out that Batman has moved on without him, you could tell yeah. he was just so disappointed and hurt and everything, and I thought, boy, this kid is really good. I don't know who he is, but he's a good actor. Another thing that I thought was kind of made, made a, or meta, beta, um, was when 
they found out he was Robin and they asked him, or so are we going to see Batman? And you know, <laughs> the actor might as well turn to the camera and said, no, you're not yeah. going to see Batman. Yeah. I feel very much that was <laughs> aimed at the audience and not at them. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. That's fine. I think they've done a really nice job of making Dick Grayson a badass. And the character development on all of the characters, I thought, has been very interesting. There's never a scene where it goes to Beast Boy or something, and I'm like, oh, I don't like this guy. I'm like, oh, give me more. What's going on with him? Hey, man, those fight scenes. Yeah. Done it's spectacular. So well. This show must be, you know, I guess, again, my only fear is that this show is incredibly expensive and I have no idea if anybody is paying to watch it. I'm not. <laughs> that's, well, that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean it's, not. it's worth your money. I'll tell you that. So, Kelly, the yeah. actor playing um, Robin, I'm sorry, uh, Dick, is uh, Breton Thwaites. Okay. And he was the lead, male lead in Oculus. He was? Oh. Yeah. I like Oculus. And I don't think he, I loved him in that. <laughs> he was also, um, he plays Orlando Bloom's kid in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tells No Tales. I don't believe I stuck with that series long <laughs> enough to see <laughs> well, that. Uh, the only complaint, and it's, a, and, it's a, and it's a very minor one, it's a nitpick, is that Brandon Thwaites, is that how you say that? Does yeah. not look old enough to be a police detective but that that's just a minor you know no. a cop, yes a police detective no but that, that's just a minor criticism because he I does look him, you know. he looks like he's in his 20s right yeah, he looks like 22 or 23 to me but maybe i'm just getting old you i mean if you make detective before 30 you are a hot shot right yeah so but you know i'm not going to quibble about that when everything else is just done so well Right. And I suppose you could, you, you know, you can become a detective by passing all of the tests and, and all the requirements and everything like that. And I suppose if you are trained by the world's greatest detective, that maybe you could pass all those tests very early. Very true. I, you know, I actually think you need time on the job, too. There's like an apprenticeship that takes place. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember uh, someone talking about being trained as a detective and like they um he went up to see his uh the person he was like working with like the senior partner on the team who'd been on the job for a while and was responsible for training him he'd do stuff like um take like a handful of stuff out of his pocket throw it on the desk and sweep it right back up and says tell me everything i put down there you, you know what i mean it's like yeah um, I, I think you're right. He's in reality 28 or 9. And I just think even if you've passed all the tests and studied all the books, that practical experience that you only get from working under a mentor, I, I just don't think that can be replaced. But it, like, I, like I said, it's a, it's a minor quibble. So, you know. Uh, well, there's a rumor, Rick, that Doctor Who's showrunner and star are going to be leaving relatively soon already. Did you yeah, see that? I saw that. Yeah. And even though I, I think the last episode got better reviews than the previous ones, we guess to getting a little too PC oriented with this show. Well, and I don't, I don't, I don't mind. PC messages, you know, sexism is bad and all that stuff. And, you know, we can't, that's, that's, but they're just not written very well. They're too heavy handed. Yeah. They're too heavy handed. That's a great point. They're just all, they're just on the nose. And the first job of a TV series is to entertain. And if you can send some sort of positive or teaching message along with that entertainment, that's great. But it, those are, these have just not been good stories. And I, someone made a really good point online. I don't remember who, but it was, or where I was reading it, but it was, it was, you know, with David Tennant and Matt Smith and even with uh, 
uh, Peter Capaldi. Peter Capaldi, yes, thank you. They they had this floundering period where they were kind of cooking, you know, in the first episode, trying to figure themselves out once again after a regeneration. But very quickly, they did some very Doctor Who type things, like you know David Tennant on that spaceship, you know coming out of the TARDIS, you know, he said, all I needed was a good cup of tea or whatever. And then he just goes to town on these guys and sends them away. Um, Matt Smith, he's, you know, his famous line in the first episode is 20 minutes to save the world. I can do it. You know, and he does do it. And then he calls back the aliens and says he wasn't through with them yet and proceeds to give them a tongue lashing and then tells them they can go. You know, that's Doctor Who. And then after, what, five or six episodes, I've not seen the new Doctor Who do anything like that. Like, you know, you're if, if, you, if you mess with me or people I care about, you're not going to win type of attitude. The closest to that was in the first episode, but they haven't gotten anywhere closer to that afterwards. Yeah, and um, this is the first female Doctor Who, and I think that Jodie Whittaker deserves better stories than what she's getting. You know, if if this if she does leave, if if this new showrunner does fail, if these stories don't get on track really quickly, you know, there's going to be an awful lot of misogynists out there, misogynistic uh, Doctor Who fans saying that it was because she was the new Doctor Who was female, which is not the reason it's the stories it's the writing so so i don't know uh all i know is i love doctor who and i've stopped watching it this season because i'm bored so well on, on, on a more positive light just to say wages of shield got revived for a seventh season oh wow even though we don't have the sixth season yet so there will be seven seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. They're very wow. confident. <laughs> when does that come back? It's going to be, uh, it's now going to be a summer series. Okay. There'll only be 13 episodes in season six, and I think season seven will probably be the same. I'm okay with that. Because they can do a good story arc in 13 episodes. Uh, okay, Matt wants to talk about the Emperor of Dreams documentary, but just real quick before we get there, uh, you know, I think we ponder this question from time to time about why do we, we as, as humans in general and, you know, horror fans in particular, why do we read horror? Why do we write horror? Why do we watch horror movies, watch ho scary TV shows and so, so on and so forth? You know, and I've always been somewhat unsatisfied with the answers, but I came across one that I think makes the most sense of anything that I've ever seen. Uh, it's, of all places, it's on marketwatch.com. Um, here's a quote from that article. Evolution happens about more slowly than civilization does. So human beings are still wired for fear at a time when many of us, if we're lucky, live daily lives now where we don't have an actual physical, a lot of physical fear. So giving yourself a dose of artificial fear in a safe environment can be a fulfilling thrill. What do you guys think? I think that's a really good explanation why, you know, we're still hard, hardwired for it. So that's one of the reasons why we like it. I hear crickets. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like why do we go on roller coasters or the the drop uh, rides you know it it gives us that sense of adrenaline and that rush but it's also completely safe you know subconsciously we know that everything's safe but at the same time you know we're we're putting our bodies into positions that they think are very dangerous and so they have that that response. That response that we used to get when, you know, yes. thousands of years ago just by surviving. Right. And now here's the interesting thing, 
and because it, it play, it's it's not just that you get the response; it's the aftermath of the response that you survived, you made it through. That means you're better than whatever you were facing, and you get this sort of euphoria. It, yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, there's this the there's the when I used to run, there's this sort of high, this runner's high you get mm -hmm. during the run, but then. After you're done, after you've accomplished it, there's a completely different sensation. And yeah. they're very different, but yet they're almost drug-like. Yeah. In stimulating that part of your brain that craves something to do. Yeah. Matt might have some insights on this. Nope. I got no, <laughs> no insight whatsoever. It's like, I don't know why I like these things. It's like the guy from Warriors. I just like doing stuff like that. It's like, I mean, okay, I've looked at all kinds of stuff about evolution. It's like, why did religion evolve? evolve? Why did the, the propensity to believe in religion, why did um, music evolve? And the best explanation, I'm going to butcher this, I can come up with what I've heard, is that it was a way of placing everybody in the herd on the same emotional state. So that when you were all getting set for the big migration or the big hunt or the big uh, celebration, the musical, the um, spiritual things that people would do to inspire you, it was getting everybody. And this, remember, is when uh, family groups were, say, 30 to 60 people at the most. Yeah, at the most, yeah. You know, so like it was basically you're trying to get this small group of people all on the same page and and that group was then if therefore more successful so that interest was promoted over millennia yeah and yeah, i don't and, know what that has to do with horror that's the best i got and you know religion and so forth fear of death um this makes me think some for some reason a friend of mine he wouldn't want me to mention his name he's pretty private person goes by john smith on the internet philip fricasi <laughs> yeah philip fricasi uh no he, he he wrote me this whole i don't know it was like five paragraphs about how he beat depression and one of the key components was walking every day and you know because that's a key part of how we evolved you know walking uh you know, like staring into a fire, that sort of thing. Uh, and not just walking, but walking with a destination in mind, like going to get a loaf of bread from the store and walking back, you know, don't drive there, walk there. So walking with a purpose every day has done more for me than anything else. So for whatever that's worth, maybe it helps some people, maybe it doesn't, but I found it interesting. Uh, Matt wants to talk about, um, the Emperor of Dreams documentary. Yes. Um, you guys, okay. some, I know some of you guys saw this because Derek Hussey sent it to me. I've not um, had a chance to watch it yet. Yeah, oh, I saw oh, it as okay. well. You're uh, probably familiar with the documentary that came out in 2011, The Fear of the Unknown, I think it was, uh, the Lovecraft documentary. Right. Well, Lovecraft uh, is about as close as you can get to a household, a, a general, a lot of people know about Lovecraft directly or indirectly or have been influenced by his works, you know, like we talk about The Thing by John Carpenter or Cthulhu plushies or playing Call of Cthulhu without ever having read Lovecraft or any of the fiction. That's got a much broader appeal than Clark Ashton Smith, but in many ways, Clark Ashton Smith was the better artist. You know what I mean? I, and, and it was very fun for me to finally see this documentary and uh, get to know some more tidbits of his life beyond what was on Wikipedia. Um, I think the director was, for the most part, astutely chose the people that they interviewed. They interviewed um, 
someone, uh, it was, I guess, CAS's stepson. He married late in life, and it was uh, the, the they they interviewed his stepson, who uh, basically got to know him when he was like fourteen some years old, something like that, and uh, knew him the rest of his life, and was there in the room when he died. And so here was an interview, like with Lovecraft. Now you can't do that, but here was an interview with someone who had actually heard him speak. And one thing they did was they saved for the very end and this was super effective i think it might be the only recording of clark ashton smith reading his own work and they had the renowned poet donald sydney fryer reading the beginning of the hashish eater which is where the name the emperor of dreams comes from uh bow down i am the emperor of dreams and but this is actually donald sydney fryer kind of like um Clark Ashton Smith sort of handed him the baton as a, a fantastical poet, you know, and he's still alive. And he knew Clark Ashton Smith as well personally, visited him in the late 50s. I think he died in like 1961 or something like that. He, the last time he visited him was like 1959, something like that. I just found this all very fascinating um, to know all these tidbits and to see all these photographs of Smith and uh, pictures of his little sculptures and some of his art. Um, so I thought it was, th there, I only have one thing that I wish the uh, director hadn't done, which is there's no extant video of Smith. Um, so they, they don't have any film like of Smith walking, talking or doing anything. And so when they were talking about his most famous story, The City of the Singing Flame, they had an actor portray Smith walking in those same hills. I didn't find that necessary or helpful. Mm -hmm. It didn't detract from the movie, but I, I really wish they had just confined themselves to actual photographs of Smith. Oof. So if, if you are interested in... Um, knowing something more about him and getting this kind of vivid recollection of people who actually knew him. Uh, I think it's well worth watching. I'll just mention uh, before we keep, before we talk about it anymore is that it's available from hippocampus press. Um, if you Google hippocampus, H I P P O C A M P U S, just like it sounds basically, Hippocampus and uh, the Emperor of Dreams, then it should bring you right to it. Yeah, I, I posted a link on the uh, okay uh, the Facebook page too. Well, th for those who are listening in their car, or, you know, and can't write it down or can't see it there, um, you can find it there. Uh, it's available on DVD for fifteen dollars, which I think is pretty reasonable. So. Uh, it's a bargain for. I mean, this isn't the kind of um, uh, the the I guess uh, Scott Connors is writing a biography of Smith or something like that, isn't he? Yes. Uh, uh, so that's not been published yet. You know, this is probably your best way to get a sort of comprehensive uh, sense of his life. Rick and Kelly, Pete, did you see it yet? No. Okay. Rick and Kelly, you guys have any comment about it? I, I've seen it and. Uh... It's remarkable for the people besides Smith, the people they interview. You yeah. Get to see, you, get, you got William Pugmire, you already mentioned Scott Connors, Arlen Smith, Ellison. You know, Arlen Ellison, who, who I never would have normally associated with Smith. But it appears that Smith was a major influence on his writing. Yeah. And it's uh, just. Uh, and even these, there were a lot of people that I never heard of, but they're fascinating people. Yeah, and I, you know, when I went into it, uh, I didn't really know much about Clark Ashton Smith at all. I'd only read a couple of stories, and I had no idea that he was such a visual artist, that he was a sculptor, and all of these things. And so it just really, you know, really opened up my eyes to what a creative he was. And the funny thing is, it's like he did things in phases. Like 
first he was a poet. Yeah. Then he was a prose author, and part of the reason he may have been a prose author was to try and support his ailing parents. And then when he got tired of writing prose, that's when he just picked up rocks in his backyard and started carving them. And he was real autodidact in all of this, you know. Uh, people read his poetry and made suggestions or whatever, but he never was like formally educated. Like Lovecraft, he never completed high school. In fact, they, there's, they, they mention how he was doing odd jobs around Auburn, California to make ends meet. And nobody knew who he was in his own hometown. And yet one of the striking things one of his, his uh, stepson said was, you know, it's like no one really ever thought of him much. And then there'd be a knock at the door and there'd be people from Japan who wanted to come and meet Clark Ashton Smith. <laughs> okay. Well, like I said, just Google Hippocampus and the Emperor of Dreams, and you should find that pretty easily. Uh, we're all giving Chilling Adventures of Sabrina a thumbs down, right? I give it a thumbs up. Yeah, I loved it. What are you talking about? Secret you ballad. loved it? I loved it. But I, I, I realize it's not going to get everybody's taste. I, th I think Kelly and Matt disagree with you guys. We talked about it before the show. Mm. I definitely disagree with you guys. Matt hated it. So you watched it, you didn't like it? I watched half of the first episode and couldn't stomach it anymore, if that's what you mean. Oh, well, that seems like a perfect way to make a review of the entire series. I'm not reviewing it. I'm just saying what I didn't like asshole. it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done after episode two. I just can't. I can't. I went all the way to four, and it just got worse. <laughs> Kelly, have you really seen it or no? Yeah. You liked it? Yeah, I, I I loved it. I mean, I thought it was silly, and but I thought it had a nice, dark, whimsical feel to it. Mm. And I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, Andy King, a listener, wrote me and said, have you guys heard that Jeremy Dyson from the UK series The League of Gentlemen is working on a series based on the strange stories of Robert Eggman? Have you guys heard that? Yes, yes, I have. Okay. That, that's all I know. So, and that is the whole news report. That that concludes our news report on that. And now you know the rest of the story. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Um, have some. Let's have some. Space archaeology. No. No. <laughs> Space archaeology. I didn't know like that there was an arc in space. No, I, I, I like these, and I go, I go in phases with my reading habits. So just today, I was thinking, you know, I liked uh, the Engines of God. It's been a few years since I've read that book, and I like these stories where mankind, they're out in their kind of beginning stages, maybe of exploring the galaxy, and they come across. You know, on a planet, evidence of an ancient civilization, that sort of thing. And it's kind of Lovecraftian, too, if you think about it. But um, I got a couple of recommendations here. Rogue Moon. Have you read this, Pete? By Algis Burgess? Budgess. Okay. A long time ago. Uh, of course, Rendezvous with Rama. I've read that. Yeah. Um. Engines of God, I already mentioned that. I'm looking at a, a list of them. Uh, I think there's a, a, a story you'd really like by David Brin called, I think it's called The Crystal Spheres. Okay. Um, is it a novel or a short story? It's a short story. Okay. Um, but then, again, his whole uh, Uplift universe is based on a bit of uh, alien archaeology. So... Okay. You might you might enjoy those books. Uh, Across a billion years by Robert Silverberg. Um, yeah, that's that's not know, one I've ever read. Kind kind of along those lines, it's like one thing that I found really interesting about Charlie Strauss's story, A Colder War, is like uh, they they 
they, they get this fossil or whatever, this shell or something, and they show it to a biologist, you know, all hush hush. And he starts going on about like, you know, well, in terms of how life really behaves, we only have a sample size of one. And so seeing this raises all kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that would just be fascinating if they ever actually found life that evolved on a, a different place. Um, the other one that looked interesting to me that I've downloaded the sample into my Kindle, we'll see, is uh, In the Ocean of Night by Gregory Benford. I think I read that. I think there's a sequel too. Yeah, yeah, there is. So, but anyway, you know, it, it's sort of at the Mountains of Madness type stuff, you know, if you think about it. Yeah, well, you know, it, and we've talked about this before. Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End is super Lovecraftian. Yeah. Um, and Clark was a, a, a kind of closet Lovecraftian. He wrote, was it At the Mountains of Murkiness? A parody of At the Mountains of Madness? He did? I didn't know. Yeah. That. That's in uh, Robert M. Price's anthology, The Antarctic Cycle. Yes. Hmm. Well, I find it fascinating. Engines of God, I really enjoyed. Um, so I don't know. I'm just kind of in the mood to read that, and I thought I'd share that with the listeners. Um, I'm really interested in the, this, too. I don't know if I'll even get an email on this or if I'll get a 1,000 emails on this. But if you're a listener and you've had a true life supernatural event happen to you, some kind of paranormal paranormal experience, or, you know, just anything that you can't explain, um, and you want want us to read it on the show at some point in the future, send me an email and tell me about it, lovecrafteasing at gmail.com. And uh, I think ones with bridges are the best, don't you, Pete? Yes, I have a story about a bridge, but we'll save that. For, I've already told this story. I, I didn't say you had to tell it right now. Yeah. Look, we've heard, we've heard the bridge story, and we've heard the Shadow Man story from right. uh, Mike. Yes. Well, out of just this small group of people sitting here, we've got those two. So I figured maybe the listeners have some that they'd like me to share. So lovecrafteasing at gmail.com. Um, and you don't have to tell me Kelly is humble when you write this week, so. But it doesn't hurt. <laughs> uh, anything else it we got to talk either. about? I have several things here we could talk about, but we're well, closing yeah. in on two hours, so. Uh, Pickman's Gallery is the prize. Um, I love, you know, Matt, I had forgotten that I had written that story. And I really do like that because it's it's literally a, a, the continuation of the of the conversation. Yeah, it is. It's good. Uh, there are lots of good stories in this book, if I do say so myself. And I think you did a good job. Well, the authors did. Well, you did a nice job of picking them out. Okay. Because I'm sure there were lots others that didn't make it. Oh my God. I. Okay, so rule number one, if you're submitting a story to an editor, don't piss the editor off. This is true. Rule number one, that means that if it says, send me a Lovecraft story, you don't send a ghost story. Actually, I've actually had that happen to me. I, I've, yeah. Yes. So, uh, so, yeah, if you'd like to have a print copy or be in the running for a print copy of Pickman's Gallery, edited by Matthew Carpenter, uh, send an email to Lovecraft Easing Prizes. This is the email I just used for random prize selection. Lovecraft Easing Prizes at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to send me an email about anything else, just please send it to the Lovecraft Easing at gmail.com. That gets checked every day as opposed to the other one. Uh, when which just gets checked when there's a need for it. So, uh, all right, anything else, guys? 
Uh, next week, we got Mark Severson. December the 9th, we have Victor Lavelle. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, next week, we're also going to have, just for a few minutes, these guys who are doing a live-action role play, a Lovecraftian live-action role play in Providence in April. Oh, so. man. Why can't they do it in August? Make it part of Necronomicon. I, I, I'll know. I'll tell you exactly why they can't do it in August. It's too friggin' hot. All right. Yeah. They had a LARP, a Lovecraftian LARP, at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, but it was taking place uh, on the travel day for me, so I don't really know what happened with it. Hector Plasmic said at the beginning of the show on the live chat, Kelly, that he listened to Dead Again podcast in the woods. Yeah. I was just, it made me think of Knife Point podcast. You know how scary that one can be. Yeah. By Soren Narnia. Imagine listening to that one in the woods. That would be creepy. <laughs> yeah. Especially if it's a, you know, if, if the story takes place in the woods or something. And there are several, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, if you've not listened to Knife Point Horror, you should. Uh, especially the episodes read by Soren Narnia. So, all right. Well, I hope all you Americans out there had a great Thanksgiving weekend. I did. Had a great time with my family. Uh, and I hope you did too. Thanks for tuning in live with us. And um, anyone who's listening or watching later, thank you as well. Uh, we'll do this um, Pickman's Gallery contest through the end of the week. So, next saturday that's when that, that that'll be the deadline this is next saturday night today again is the 25th of november 2018 so well guys thanks a lot and everyone thanks for listening become a patreon and we'll see you next week bye bye